to do the chain run. And how do you do that? Four, six seconds, point eight, point feet, everything you got. Everything you got. Turn that shit up. Let's go. Let's go. Welcome to the Scoop World Order Spring Break Edition. We uh, The guys are all on spring break, having a great time. It is Sunday, so they've got another seven days to enjoy wherever they're at, whatever they're doing. We are going to be bringing you the heat for the next week. We've got all kinds of great stories to tell in the void before spring ball with pads kicks off next Monday. Um, just really excited about, about what we got going on. I think the team is energized and focused. Uh, the kids that I've been in touch with have been doing phenomenal work. You know, they're training hard during the spring break. They're also getting a little time with their family. So it's always a great little mixture of, uh, of the two things. I, uh, I always loved spring break. I never went anywhere. I always just stayed and trained and, uh, we'd go home for maybe a day or two to Maslin, see my parent or see my mom, see my, you know, my sister or whatever, and just chill. But, you know, I was a big fan of being here training getting a good three, four hours in at the Woody Hayes every day, you know, get a nice little, you know, cold tub, hot tub treatment and, you know, just go enjoy the day, play some video games and chill. So uh, I am um, excited about uh, where the guys are going. They look great so far and uh, let's see where they're going. So I'm going to uh, bring in Nevada, but real quick, if you guys are enjoying this, please leave us a like on our channel, um, you know, like this video, share it. I mean, we are really growing. It's been very encouraging. You guys, you know, we're asking for your help and you guys are doing it. It takes two seconds to subscribe to the to the channel and uh, we're growing. So, I mean, it's working and we appreciate you guys. Give us a like and always leave us comments and feedback because the comments and feedback really help us kind of tune the show, make it better. So you guys are, you know, your input is greatly appreciated. Even if it's something that's, you know, you might think is constructive criticism, it helps me make it better. So I just want to make it better for you guys. So we appreciate that. So with that, I'm going to bring in, my good friend Nevada Buck. Nevada, how are you tonight? Doing great, doing great. The uh, it's a it's a good time of the year. You know, they got a couple of days of practice in. Kids are going off to enjoy some time with the family, and uh, then things get serious here. So it's been fun, kind of looking at what they've accomplished the first couple of days, and kind of the evolution of spring ball and. Um, no, this is definitely one of the most exciting times of the year and certainly a good time to be an Ohio State fan. Yeah, and and we talked in the pre-show about the evolution of spring practice, specifically early enrollment. Tell me a little bit about, you've been doing this for you know, 25, 30 years. Tell me a little bit about what it used to be like. I mean, initially, you, know, you and I were conversing, was Maurice Claret the first guy to do this in 2002? Now it's pretty widespread, but talk to me a little bit about you know, how it's grown and how it is so prevalent now compared to maybe when you got, you initially started in this business. Well, you know, I, I, I'm sure that maybe Claret wasn't the first to do it, but he's the first that I can remember that did it because I remember when he did it, it was like, Whoa, you know, what's going on. You know, I, I, I didn't even really understand the concept of uh, coming in and, you know, missing his last half of his high school year and, um, you know, now you've got guys reclass. You guys, guys got skipping entire years and reclassifying and coming early and doing things. But when when Maurice did it, it was really a, kind of a shot across the bow to the team. This guy, he really meant business. Was coming in early, started calling out guys from the very beginning, and you just knew that he was a different kind of football player. Um, and you know, now early in early, it's like you said, it's it's pretty typical. But up, you know, the hit rate on guys that come in early is, is really, really high because you just know that those are the serious football players. These are the guys that are that are coming to play early, that look at themselves as potentially three and done players. And you know, I bet if you went back and and looked at the guys you know, over time, they're certainly not all hits, but you know, there's a lot more hits than there are misses on that because uh, it's it's quite a commitment on on behalf of any young man to do something like that. And and uh, they they certainly turn out to be some fine football players. Yeah, and and for me, I uh, for me, I was always a big fan of the guys that wanted to come in early because you don't have to recruit them anymore, which is huge. Um, you know, something that was a, a big issue with Urban was he always wanted like if you had like a five star guy, a high end guy, get him in in January because then you don't have to worry about Georgia poaching them or Bama or you know Florida State or whoever because that. That was always a major issue with uh, the recruiting game. Is you get these kids in here, they can't. You know, now it's it's obviously different with the portal, but it's just one of those things where you uh, 
I don't know. You, you just you, you want to get the kids on on campus and get them into the conditioning program and get them ready to go for spring because some of these kids, you know, their growth and their maturity far exceeds where guys were 20 years ago. And it's really crazy because, you know, these kids, again, you said they're skipping entire years like Sunny Sells is going to skip his entire senior year to be a Buckeye this fall. And that was almost unfathomable back when I played, you know, so the, the nutrition and the development is, is, uh, is pretty incredible. Were there any players that when they showed up, obviously Maurice is one that you're like, this guy's, you know, he's going to make an impact this year. You mentioned Dante Whitner. Uh, you mentioned Ashley Abode, uh, some other guys that came in early, but were there any guys that you're specifically like, really like, this is going to be a guy that's going to contribute this year and make a big difference. Well, you know, to keep it current with a lot of guys, because you know, Bodie and Whitner are like practically ancient history to our young bucks. But uh, a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. that came in and, you know, was repping 225. I, I can't remember it was whether it's 13 or 15 or 18 times or something like that. And, you know, you know guys that are coming in with, that are that are grown men already, um, you know, that's that's really been the biggest thing thing that's really kind of struck me about this is just how well conditioned these guys are. You mentioned nutrition, you know, strength and conditioning has just come so far. You know, they've all got private trainers. They've all, you know, been on uh, regiments. You know, Coach Mick is getting this stuff out there to guys. And it used to be he'd send stuff out to guys and guys would kind of look at it, maybe glance at it a little bit and then figure when they hit campus, they'd get serious about it. But now it's it's literally you know, they, you know there, it, it is down to a science because it is a science and I think that you know the combination of those things is resulting in guys that are coming that are ready to play from day one and uh, and we're seeing that with a lot of the early enrollees you know even today. Yeah, and I, I remember specifically like Taylor Decker. He came in early for for spring ball, and I remember being left behind. So I'm going to tell a quick 2012 story. This is pretty hilarious. So I was the only guy in the building. I stayed behind just because I was trying to be there in case anybody needed me, you know, but everyone's gone. Urban was gone. You know, Ed Warner was gone. Everybody was gone. It was me. Everett Weathers had office hours that day and Kenny Parker, the, the strength coach who went to Rutgers. Now he's actually back as our associate head strength coach. Uh, he's like Mickey's number, number two right now. And Orlando Brown jr. Showed up to campus and, you know, nobody was there. I mean, like, you know, Mark Antonio was in there. Nobody's there. So it's like, I literally, you know, I, I'm there. I meet Orlando Brown Jr. Obviously I knew his, his, I didn't know his dad, but like I'd gone to Brown's games, you know, 99, he got hit in the eye with the flag, but highest paid offensive tackle in NFL history. Great bloodlines. Mom was great. She was from Akron. Um, you know, Zeus, the old man played most of his career with the Browns. He was with the Ravens for a short spell. Um, you know, when they moved and then he actually was with the Ravens again after, the beanbag incident. He got a huge settlement from the NFL. And, uh, you know, I just, I really like this kick. I related to him because my dad passed away when I was young and Zeus jr. Um, his dad passed away when he was young. So we really bought over that. We walked around, you know, I took him, Kenny Parker, you know, all the you know coaches wanted me to get him on the scale, Pantone and those guys. So put it on the scale and he weighs like 380. And I mean, it was not a solid 380. It was a very, you know, jiggly 380. And, you know, I, I knew that would be a kind of a death knell for us, but you know, he had Tennessee, he had a bunch of pretty good offers. He ended up at Oklahoma. Tennessee actually pulled a scholarship on signing day because they're just wicked. He ends up at Oklahoma, ends up being an All-American, has the worst combine in NFL history, falls to the third round, and now he's a three-time Pro Bowler, and he just got franchised by the Chiefs. But, you know, he's like, you know, we talk about projects, and I, and I put him next to Dewan because, you know, he reminds me of Dewan. Like, Dewan was a kid that was a three-star kid, tall, lanky, uh, unrefined as a football player as an offensive tackle and you know he's been refined over the last few years and he's got a really bright future as long as he can lock in be consistent mature a little bit more um he's going to be a freak show at the next level and people they love these big tackles because they're great pass protectors they have super long arms they have you know they're impossible to bull rush because they i mean like dewan probably weighs 350 pounds at least you know maybe on a light day so um it was, it was it was just one of those interesting things. No matter was there any players in your time that you really thought would be like a fantastic guy that Ohio State maybe didn't go after, like a Luke Keekley or some guys that you know through your your time it's uh, that you you were wondering about. <laughs> Kurt, Kurt, cut! You have to cut. <laughs> What's up? I said you have to cut right now. I wasn't prepared for that question. 
Yeah, you know, the, the guy that I've always, you know, I, I sound like a broken record at this one, but, you know, I was really all over Ryan Kelly. Um, you know, I thought he was good, would be a terrific Buckeye. Everybody wanted him. Florida wanted him. Alabama wanted him. And for some reason, and for, you know, I, I'll never be able to understand, Ohio State didn't want him. And they were adamant. They're adamant that they couldn't play dead in a Western and he would be a terrible player and, don't know Alabama was doing it as just a tweak Ohio State kind of offer type of thing, and boy, he turned out to be a terrific player. And uh, I think that was that was one of the ones that I was the most uh, confused about that you know lack of an offer for a kid like that that Ohio State was you know, intimately familiar with, and they just just passed on him for whatever reason. Yeah, and it's it's amazing you mentioned him because I literally had someone who worked at Ohio State while I was there say that he would get processed by Alabama. He's just like, again, like you said, like a tweak, like where, you know, we were a little more prehistoric in our recruiting and Alabama was offering guys as sophomores and juniors. And, you know, they offered Briante Dunn super early. And so then, you know, we had to make a decision. Are we going to offer Briante Dunn? You know, because Alabama offered him and they just won the national title. So, you know, if the national champions from Alabama want him, should do we have to go on him? So, of course, we have to go on him immediately. And, you know, Brian, you know for every Ryan Kelly, there's a Briante Dunn that doesn't really do anything. So it's. It's just one of those, uh, one of those interesting things, man. Because when you when you're in that game, in that moment, you know, I always wonder how much of these guys actually have real conviction in their offers, or and how much of these guys is kind of like Simon says, or it's like, oh, Alabama offered, we better offer them. Oh, you know, Ohio State offered them, or Penn State offered them. You know, it's like, you know, our kid Des Jones got Penn State, and he's got a bunch more coming, and you know, is is Ohio State gonna end up going on? So it's it's just one of those uh, those interesting things where, you know, I I always wonder. You know, do you study the offer sheets or do you just study the tape? You know, do you just look at, oh, he's been offered by Bama and Georgia, so we got to offer him, or do you actually study him hard and say, no, nah, I think this kid, we really need to go on this kid because there's, you know, it takes balls to go on a kid. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt if he doesn't have a strong offer sheet, you better get going on him, or else you know you're gonna be left behind. And I think Des Jones is a guy that we better offer pretty quick here, or else he's gonna be saying, well, Penn State offered me in February, and you guys waited until July and whatever, because some of these kids they. They've got long memories and they're very sensitive. So real quick, I'm going to take us into the film room. I just got a couple of things. I got a clip. Um, I love this clip because it's just, you know, working on the craft. But I got our, our, our future left tackle, Paris Johnson here. And he's working with Willie Anderson, who is a guy that should be in the Hall of Fame. He lives in Atlanta. Obviously, uh, Mike Daniels is uh, PJ's stepdad. He is the running back coach for Georgia Tech. So, you know, when PJ goes down there, he gets to work with Willie and you know, he's doing this little barefoot stuff, little barefoot passes, but you know, his sets look smooth and, and Willie's one of the best pass protectors in the history of football. So, you know, you, you watch, you know, PJ getting in this extra work and really working his craft, you know, barefoot, which is hilarious to me just to, I guess work on his ankle flexibility, but you know, Willie, Willie's a guy that used to block Javon curse would shut out Javon curse. You know, he played for the Bengals for a long time, played for the Ravens last year. And, and, you know, it's just interesting seeing, you know, the, the the resources and the access that's available to these kids because a lot of this is because of social media. Because you know, w when I was growing up, there really wasn't a way to get a hold of a guy like Willie Anderson or a guy like Charles Bentley or Duke Mannyweather. And now with Instagram and and Twitter, you can get a hold of these kids in, in in five minutes and say, hey, you know, I'd like to come train with you over spring break, or I'd like to work on my craft or work on my vertical sets. And you could see PJ uh, getting this in. I mean. Nevada, in, in terms of the training, you know, we see these kids that they, they can play early and earlier, they can function and, and be really productive earlier and earlier. What, um, you know, in terms of development, how, how different is it from when you first started in this recruiting game? Well, it's, it's totally different. And, you know, like you said, you mentioned the individual training and the acts, the, the, I mean, think about the internet, the internet, you basically have the knowledge of the world all at everybody's fingertips right now. And, and, you know, that was something that was just, you know, science fiction, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago before Al Gore invented the internet and things like that. So <laughs> it's, um, it's really been, you know, that's really a game changer. You want to become expert at anything from, from cooking to fly fishing, to taking good left tackle pass sets, you can find it right there on the internet. And yeah, you know, then you, you combine that with you know, individual training, um, you know, highlight videos, uh, you, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it may be, it's, you know, it's amazing. And that's where you can, you see kids that, that, 
really commit themselves to stuff like that. A kid, the example would be a kid like Ali Luba last year, like yeah. Ohio State wanted to commit to Ohio State. Ohio State, oh no, he's not good. We don't want him, and no, oh, he'll never be anything. And bought, he ends up committing to Georgia, and <laughs> yeah, he, I mean Georgia has got the best offensive line in the country. He commits uh. to Georgia, so he was a pretty good player. So the, you know, all this stuff about the, he was a kid who really worked hard during the season and really spent a lot of time developing. And you know, to go from Ohio State was goofing on the kid to now he's got he's he's going to play offensive line at Georgia. It just shows you, you, you can't listen to, to the narrative. You got to like look at stuff with your own eyes, see what's kind of going on. And, uh, you know, kids change, kids develop over time. Nothing, you know, I, I tell my own kids, like, you know, if you're not getting better then you're getting worse, you have to keep working yeah. at it because you know, some other kids out there working just as hard as you are. So you, you better work harder. And that's, that's how it is all the time. Yeah. And, and like, it's, it's funny when, Again, like Ali Lubach, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's gonna be Ryan Kelly, but like you know, Ryan Kelly wasn't good enough for us to offer, and then he ends up at Bama, wins the Remington, goes first round, signed a seventy million dollar extension with the Colts, the Pro Bowler. So it's like, you know, sometimes I, I, I've I've sat in some of these O-line eval meetings, and you know, it's, sometimes it's easy to play revisionist history, but you know, th- there's guys that like you know you can take a chance on. You know, you don't want to take a chance on kind of low floor projects, but like Orlando Brown Jr. to me was a high floor project. So I was like, you get him with Coach Mick, he's going to be really good. You know, he's six foot nine, gigantic arms, huge. You know, he's just a big baby. Like, he, I mean, it was like he hadn't even hit puberty. And he was like 17 years old. It's like once he, you know, starts working out and you work with the kid, then, I mean, he's going to be a monster. And again, like, you know, he plays, he goes to the Ravens, is a Pro Bowl right tackle. Ronnie Stanley gets hurt. He ends up going to left tackle for a year. And then he, you know, demands a trade after two years because – he wants to play left tackle. His dad, who was a career right tackle, you know, always told his kid, hey, you need to play left tackle. Left tackles are more valued. So he had that kind of etched in his head. And finally, you know, when Ronnie Stanley came back, who they gave a huge extension to with the Ravens, he said, you know, demanded a trade. He said, I want to play left tackle. And, uh, you know, he goes to the Chiefs and, you know, they, they pony up. And his first year with the Chiefs, he makes a Pro Bowl. That's a Pro Bowl left tackle. So it's, you know, sometimes you got to look at the intangibles. And, you know, it's, it's, it is funny when people say that a guy can't play and then he ends up, you know, with Georgia who wins the championship and has the most physically dominating, you know, front, you know, offensive and defensive lines in the country. So it's sometimes you question that, especially when you see some of the guys that we end up with or some of the guys that we have in the room and you're like, we're not gonna take a guy that's got a Georgia offer. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's always very interesting. I guess the B roll here of Corey Stringer and, and La Charles and Orlando Pace and yeah, you know, just some of the, the greats on the O-line. Cause this is kind of an O-line centric show so far. And, and I, um, I don't know, it, it's going to be really interesting to see how this cycle goes with Justin Fry, because obviously, you know, people, have, they've complained about the offensive line recruiting, which is, you know, again, you know, you can say it's effort, you can say it's whatever. But to me, you know, if you're in the South, you have a humongous edge in offensive line recruiting, because most of the big athletic, you know, players are in the South. They're in Georgia, Louisiana, Florida, Texas, the Carolinas. You, know, you just you don't have athletes like that in Ohio anymore, just because of the the population and because of the development. So, um, you know, Georgia to me is always going to have a better line, or potentially a better line than us on the O and D lines, just because of the proximity to the talent they have. You know, and a lot of these big guys they don't like to leave home; they're mom's boys. So they, you know, I don't know if unless these guys all start moving to the north, like we're not ever going to be able to beat you know, Georgia and, and, and LSU and, and Bama. And I think that's the big reason why Brian Kelly went to, to LSU is good because you know, he saw the guys that they can get and they see the guys can get at Notre Dame and it's not the same, you know, it's like, I mean, you go to, you go to Notre Dame, man, and you're not going to get those defensive tackles that are just absolute monsters. You're not going to get those interior guys, those tackles that, that really win you the national championships. Like when you see Bama, when they're fantastic, they have, you know, Alex Leatherwood at left tackle and they have, uh, you know, like, like Evan Neal at right tackle, two first rounders. And then the year before they have Jedrick Wills, another you know first rounder. And people are like, well, why can't we do that? And I was like, well, where are those guys from? They're from, I mean, Wills is from Kentucky, but all the other guys are from the South. So you're not, you're not going to get, you know, a ton of those guys in Ohio. I mean, you're going to get a Taylor Decker every now and again, but you're not going to get, you know, like Nick Petit Frere, who was our best lineman this year. He, I mean, you had to get him from Tampa, you know, and, and most of those kids that are from there, they're not coming up to Ohio, but, um, what are your thoughts going forward on the O-line 
And uh, how excited are you to see what Justin Fry can do? So we, we probably, you know, we'll be, you know, we'll say we are in recruiting, but it's going to be a very interesting cycle because we really need some tackles in the cycle. Yeah, no, I'm I'm excited to see. I, I think new blood is always, I shouldn't say it's always a good thing, but it's always an exciting thing. It's always interesting to kind of see how things change. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely interested in terms of, you know, seeing how he does from a recruiting standpoint, because up until now, you know, his, his recruiting is really kind of an unknown. You know, he's never he's never been known as a, a a highly successful recruiter. There's a lot of reasons for that. But now we'll see at Ohio State how he does. And, uh, you know, it, it, he's certainly articulate and energetic and knowledgeable. And he's got he's got all the attributes that you'd want from a great recruiter. Now he's just got to go out and do it. Um and as for the offensive and deep, I, you know, I, I think what you were saying had a lot of validity regarding the defensive line. I think offensive line, you, you know, I've said this for a long time. I, I, I like Ohio kids on the offensive line. I think you can do really well with Ohio kids. And that's why losing a kid like a Ryan Kelly, not to beat that one to death, but that's why you just can't afford to have stuff like that happen. Because when you do have extremely talented homegrown kids, you got to get them and you got to, yeah. you know, you got to make them back guys. You got to develop them. And, and uh, you know, Ohio state's, always you know, is, is done a terrific job in terms of doing that. If you look at the, you know, the last two national championships or the, this the last one we won with five kids from Ohio and you know, two, three stars on the line. So I know they can do it, even though that was way back in 2015, like in, in the stone age of college football. <laughs> but um, no, the, uh, I think it's going to be exciting. Like I said, you know, I think Fry brings a, a different type of dimension to the, uh, the offensive line room, we'll just and we'll see how it kind of plays out because you know the proof's in the pudding. You are what your record says you are. You are what your crew say you are. So let's see how he does, and we're all excited and rooting for him to do well. Yeah, and, and I think the Ohio line thing. When I think about the guys that we've had that have been fantastic, you know, I'm obviously playing this this role, but like you know Corey Stringer, Orlando Pace, Charles, all Ohio kids. And when you look at the line, they won the championship in '14. You go left to right, you got Taylor Decker, who was about a four star. Billy Price, who was a probably a four star, maybe a high three star. Jacoby certainly was a three star. Pat Elfline was a three star, and then Daryl Baldwin was a three star. And Daryl was recruited as a D tackle. So I mean, you look at that left to right line, and none of those guys were heralded, but you know they got the job done and they, and they worked well. So you know, and you look at some of the guys that we've had, and I mean, O line is the biggest development position on the entire field because. You know, you can get some guys that have giant syndrome that are awesome in high school and they throw guys on the ground that are half their size and then they get to college and they get whipped and then they mentally can't handle it. And then you've got guys that, you know, are kind of the underdogs like a Jason Kelsey, who's, you know, potentially an NFL Hall of Famer for the Eagles, undersized guy, walk on linebacker, Cincinnati converts to center. And he's had just a, an incredible career, you know, playing and he's a guy that was always driven, always fighting. You know, every year at the combine, you see these guys that are, you know, D3 guys, D2 guys, and they have great senior bowls, have great combines. They go top 15 to 20. You know, Ali Marpet just retired, D3 guy, you know, because they've got that chip on their shoulder. Because that's like the biggest thing that people can't measure is people, they like to call it heart, but it relates to chip on your shoulder where, you know, these guys, they, they're passed over for rankings. You know, guys like Cooper Cup, guys like Aaron Rodgers, guys that, you know, they don't have the red carpet laid out for them. They have to kind of kick in the back door to get to the program they want to go to. And you know, that, that happens more on the offensive line than I think any position because, you know, there's guys that, you know, they're, they're just not heralded. And then they end up, you know, working hard and grinding. And, like, you know, Trevor Penning for, you know, he's a left tackle. He's probably going to be a top 10 pick. And he's, you know, he's, a, he's from a small school. You know, he didn't go to Ohio State, didn't go to Michigan, didn't go to Georgia or Bama. He got passed by all the schools. But some of these guys, they just grind and they've got that chip on their shoulders. So, um, but yeah, well, well, I mean, close. Think, I mean, no, but just think about it. I, 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 it's a really good point, Kirk. That you know, because I was just actually, you know, they just announced that Tom Brady is returning for another season, and you, you know, you, if you're talking about the two greatest quarterbacks of all time, you're talking about you know, probably Brady and Rodgers are somewhere in the conversation for sure. Oh, absolutely. And, I mean, Brady. You know, we all know what you know, six round pick, pick number two twenty four or whatever the heck it was, and and Rodgers was so uh, underwhelming he had to go to juco to butte yeah. community college to play quarterback and so exactly right you know you've got those guys that have something to prove that they're that play friendly like that just that play for the love of the game um i thought that was timely given the fact that uh i just saw that that brady news kind of come across my uh my phone as we're talking here that's a, that's kind of exciting him coming back for what 22nd or 23rd season 
It's it's absolutely incredible. And with and you know with with Rodgers, I mean his draft day slide is like the stuff of legends. I mean, it, it doesn't touch Brady's. Brady slide to the sixth round, but you know Rodgers is a guy that was projected number one overall. Grew up, you know, 49ers fan, and they pass on him for Alex Smith. And then he just slides and slides and slides. He's sitting in the green room, and it's like, you know, like those those are the things that develop the chips, you know? And it's like when you're a, a kid who's getting recruited, and maybe you're not getting the notoriety. Maybe people are saying, oh, he can't play. Oh, he's not good. And then they're like, oh, well, this guy's really good. And then, you know, it's like the thing that's great about football is eventually those guys that, you know, the, the analysts – say are really good they got to come see you on the field and they can show you if they're really good or not you know because they got to come see you at some point they can't just be you know out in outer space living on their their hype and their hyperbole because i lived that when i got to i say there were a lot of kids already ahead of me that were in my class and in the class ahead of me and you know like oh there's no way this guy will ever be able to touch him i was like oh we'll see we'll see who's gonna get touched you know and i mean it was it, it was really gratifying when you get to lock up with those guys and dominate them because it's you know i mean then those ratings don't matter the stars don't matter none of it matters you know and that's like the beautiful thing about football is all of a sudden you're okay let's let's see what you got and you know you, and the thing about football is it's easy to be great because all you got to do is just you got to work hard train there's so many little edges you can get by just you know outworking guys training harder working harder being more proficient with the playbook you know, I mean, I'm telling you, it's like it's it's a beautiful thing because if you put in the work, you can be really good. You know, it takes it takes some you know some ability and some confidence and some size, but you know, there's a lot of guys that are walking around that are six four that can't play at Ohio State, and that's like the the beauty of of being there. And, and I'm telling you, that edge is real, the chip is real, and uh, it's it's just fun to to go through that process and then finally get to see those guys. You know, because the guys that have it easy. A lot of times, you know, there's a lot of guys that are nipping at their heels that want to eat their lunch. You know, the Cooper Cups, the guys that break into the gym and they're on the jugs machine in the middle of the night on a Sunday night. You know, Janner gives him the key to the the gym and he's working out and he turns into the best receiver in the NFL. Like he wasn't a five star guy that got official visits and got to make a, a call on you know signing day at the Army game. He's a guy that was like everything he did was about ball. You know, because he had to give every little ounce he had to be the guy that he wanted to be. So. But no, this is a this has been a good one, man. I'm telling you, I love talking about spring ball. I love talking about rising stars. You know, I'm excited to see you know Jaden Ballard. I think Julian Fleming and Jaden Ballard is turning out to be a heavyweight fight at the Z position, the speedster wide receiver. Um, I'm really excited about that. I'm excited for spring ball to start back up. But it was good to knock this episode out. So I'm closing Nevada. You got anything to close us out? No, nah, just uh, you know, just keep an eye on some of the unheralded guys. I think you know there's some guys in the offensive line that are really starting to make some moves and, you know, it, it, may, it may not be the guys that you're thinking. It may not, you know, it may not be the five stars. It's you know, guys that get written off pretty quickly um, sometimes can surprise you. And I think, I think we're in for some surprises this year, uh, especially. Yeah. And, and, you know, depth is always critical. You know, Jacob James is really making a move. You know, again, Dewan wasn't a, he wasn't a Herald guy, but I think he's really doing, he's doing yeoman's work and, yeah, I think he's got a big year at right tackle. I think we could have the best pair of tackles of the nation potentially with him in Paris. So I don't know who I'd trade for those guys. I'm sure Alabama's got a pair that are probably pretty good, but you know, there's you know Georgia. I'm sure has a pair that are pretty good, but you know, our guys are going to be pretty formidable, and they're putting in the work. And you know, like I said, I'm just excited to see you know how this offensive line performs because again, I thought last year we had a fantastic offensive line. We won a lot of statistics. You know, maybe weren't as consistent as we liked, but. You know, still, it's you know we played we play good teams this year. We have a tougher schedule, younger offensive line, so it's going to be really interesting to see how these guys do. So, with that, uh, to close us out, you know we've we've been growing. It's been a blast. If you want the inside information, if you want the scoop, join BuckeyeScoop.com, where you're the number one inside information website. We're an incredible community of people. I've become very close with a ton of our members. Uh, we're growing like a weed. Um, spring ball is always like one of the best times because everybody wants to see who's next. Everybody, everyone's always obsessed with who's the next guy. And you know, we've we've been very consistent at breaking that. So if you want to know what's really going on in Ohio State, join BuckeyeScoop.com. Join our community. It's fantastic. We appreciate you guys. Keep supporting us. All the love is appreciated. All the comments, all the likes, all the subscriptions to our site, all the subscriptions to this YouTube page. They're all very much appreciated. We appreciate you. Thank you, Buckeye Nation. You guys have a great day. Go Bucks.